All right, I think we'll get started. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Welcome. I'm Kristen Motti, an adult programs librarian at the Boston Public Library Central Library. Our featured author and guest moderator will both be joining us in just a moment. First, just a little bit of housekeeping and an introduction to tonight's author, and then a welcome from our partner for tonight, Ameri from American Ancestors in the New England Historic Genealogical Society and some information on how you can get a copy of tonight's featured book in search of Emma. So we're in Zoom webinar, your cameras and microphones are muted. Closed captioning is available and you can turn it on or off by the live transcript button on the bottom of your screen. The chat is open for, behind the, scene, for the behind the scenes team to share links out to you through, throughout the program. We'll be sharing how to buy the book, links to the author's website um, and other, other links that might be of interest to you. But we do wanna hear from you. So you can type your questions and comments in the Q&A box at any time during today's program. This event is being recorded and will be available on our websites in the coming weeks. To purchase a signed copy of In Search of Emma, please visit our bookstore partner for tonight's talk, Trident Booksellers and Cafe. And we will be putting the link in the chat on how to buy the book. Um, there is a free shipping code, which you can use to get free media mail shipping. Also, you could check your local public library for copies of tonight's featured book as well. Just a little bit about tonight's featured author, Armando Lucas Correa. Armando Lucas Correa is a Cuban, Cuban writer, journalist, and editor. His first novel, The German Girl, was an international bestseller translated into 14 languages and published in more than 20 countries. A multi-award winner, Correa was most recently named Journalist of the Year by the Hispanic Public Relations Association of New York. Since 1991, he has worked as a journalist. He is currently editor-in-chief at People in Espanol. Now, please join me in welcoming Margaret Talcott, who will tell us a little bit about tonight's guest moderator. Margaret, welcome. Thank you, Kristen. Um, I'm Margaret Talcott. I'm Director of Literary Programs and the American Inspiration Author Series at American Ancestors, NEHGS, here in Boston. Our Library and Research Center is just two blocks away from the BPL. Many of you have read his best-selling fiction, but tonight Armando is here with a book that is right in the wheelhouse of my genealogy organization, A True Story of Families. His memoir is all about creating a family, something that our moderator this evening knows a lot about. Elizabeth Jurenovich is the founder and executive director of Abrazo Adoption Associates in San Antonio, Texas. Among her many degrees, you can see them on the screen, all those letters, uh, she is a licensed professional counselor and a marriage and family therapist. Before Elizabeth settled into her important work in adoption and in counseling, she played piano professionally, she worked in public relations, and she also directed children's church choirs. Elizabeth is the daughter of a preacher, and she raised two sons as a single mother. She is going to join us shortly. Now, though, let's hear from our featured author, Armando Lucas Correa. Welcome, Armando. We are so glad that you're here with us. Um, over to you. We can't hate, wait to hear more about your book. Welcome. Thank you, Margaret. I am so happy to present In Search of Emma today, the publishing day with you here at the Boston Public Library. Thank you for choosing my book. In Search of Emma is my most personal book, one I never thought I write. I, I remember that an editor at HarperCollins came to my office a couple of years ago at People in Espanol, and I thought he was interested in publishing a book about uh, legendary Hispanic celebrities. But he actually wanted to talk me into writing a book about how I had my daughter, the surrogacy. I was shocked. I usually don't speak or write about my personal life. It took him a while to convince me. But I agreed to do it. When I went over notes I'd been keeping throughout the process, I discovered I had extensive records of conversation I had with my family over the years it took to make them. And now I am ready to talk with Elizabeth. Yeah. 
Thank you so much, Armando. It's a pleasure to be here with you. And it, it was an absolute joy to read your book because one of the realities is that the desire to parent is one of the most inherent and innate of human longings. And a startling number of, of would-be parents encounter unanticipated problems in that quest, whether it's, it's due to the lack of a partner, whether it's due to fertility complications, and the options oftentimes seem few and far between. And it forces people to go to extraordinary lengths to, to become parents against all odds. And I think your book is such a remarkable testament to the lengths that a a would-be parent will go to make that dream come true. And I'm so I'm so impressed with the enormous sacrifices that you made along the way and the way that you you allowed that drive, that dream to drive you against all odds. I know that you've said in your book that October is is a month of vulnerability and challenges for you um, as you approach the end of each year. And it seems significant to me that we're having this talk in October, which is what leads into National Adoption Month in, in November. And I want to wish you also a happy birthday because I know this is just <laughs> too much. <laughs> so what do you know now that you didn't know when you started this journey? If you were giving advice to the, to the the younger than you were, what would you what would you tell yourself? You know, you know, it's, it's always a long process to become a, a parent. You know, uh, some people has it, you know, never is easily, but I think some people has it immediately. And I I remember you know, I I was born in Cuba. I came here in at the beginning of the night, 1991, and I always dream to be a father maybe because I grew up without one and and when I started I said okay uh, we have we have to fight against all the obstacles that we have but in the long process Elizabeth I think I learned that you can never give up you have to continue you know I I dream my daughter I remember that and I saw her and I knew I gonna have her. At the beginning, uh, I thought it, 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 it's gonna be a baby. I never thought it's gonna be a boy or a girl. And then we started to her like Emma. And then we have Emma, you know, with a lot of accidents, as you see in the book. But, but for me, you never give up. You have, and, and this is something that I, I follow in my life, you know. I, I, I always try to do in my way and, and, and sacrifice. And, it's almost as if you conjured her into existence. Yeah, yeah. You know, it, it, I, I think, you know, because right now I have my three kids and I saw them, but it was exhausting. And, 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 and you know, it, it was very expensive at the same time. I didn't have the money. I have to sell my my apartment to have my daughter. But you know, uh, I think when I decided to write the book, it served as an emo emotional outlet for me, and and it helped me at the. Uh, I know I know that it can help many people. You know, they they want to have their kids uh, via adoption, via surrogacy, but. Uh, for me, it was like a, it was like a emotional, you know, liberation. I think. <laughs> yeah. Were you and your partner always on the same page? Because I know a lot of times couples aren't. Yeah. You know, I the one who wants to be a father, it was me uh, since the beginning. I I I think Gonzalo at the beginning, he thought that I it was a dream. It was an impossible dream. But he, when we met the surrogate mother and 
when he saw they have the agency, when he saw the guns, right, I said, okay, this is gonna happen. And then we had the first accident, you know, we lost the pregnancy and, and of course we, were, we cried a lot and we were depressed. But you know, the depression for me, it, it was a couple of hours. I need to find another a donor when, you know, the one that we selected, she didn't have enough eggs of polygon. And then uh, I move on, you know, I move, <laughs> move the page and then we started again the process. And a couple of accidents when we lost like a real pregnancy, you know, the transfer of the embryos, I decided they're gonna keep silent uh, to my friends and my family, even to him. Because uh, for me it was, uh, you know, it was uh, terrible every time that we lost part of the process or we lost the pregnancy and receive all the call from my sister, my mother, him. Uh, it was terrible for me. And then I decided they're gonna keep the whole process closed until we have confirmed a pregnancy. And, and I live in New York. I did the whole process in San Diego, California. I remember me taking every week uh, an early flight, going there, coming back in the red eye, both, until I got, you know, I had the possibility to announce that we're gonna have a baby, you know. And it's not uncommon for couples to grieve in different ways. And it, it seemed to the reader sometimes in the book that you were doing the lion's share of the work in this process. I know that sometimes it, the partner that's behind the scenes is, is helping in their own way, but how did you all balance, especially because you were going to be the biological father, were you able to draw Gonzalo into that process so that he didn't feel left out or I don't think so. Uh, I decided to be the father because my partner, Gonzalo, uh, they, they have really a gene of the cystic fibrosis. And she, uh, he has a, a sister living in, in Italy that she has this, the sickness. And it was too risky. Yeah. And at the same time, you know, uh, uh, the, the medical insurance is with me and, you know, we're trying to be practical at that moment. When when we were ready to have Emma, he was really involved, like my whole family. When Emma was born, we have all his sister came from around the world and all my family we rented a house for a couple of weeks in San Diego. Um, and we decided he's gonna be a full-time dad at home, you know. Uh, He's professionally, he's a photographer and he decided to stay at home. And, and then I became papa for, the, for Emma and he became papi and he decided that. <laughs> that was fine. And he's really involved, you know, because I am, I, I am at the beginning, I, I was lucky because I was not the editor in chief in People in Espanol. I was the number two executive editor. And uh, I, I would think it would take like a year off from, from the office. And my, and my boss said, don't Armando, don't worry, you can work from home. And then I, I we moved to, to Miami, close to the family. I have my mother, my sister, a lot of friends and family there. And um, I stayed with, with Gonzalo and Emma uh, for three years at home and, and we fly together to New York every every month for a week for the closing for the magazine go back and it, it was great and then I remember when we started the process to have the twins uh, I was named editor-in-chief of the brand I have to move to New York and it was like a nightmare at that moment <laughs> I was really uh, always involved uh, with the schools and you know, I, he's more strict than me. I'm more flexible. I think I am more patient than him. And because be, being a parent is hard, you know, having three kids with different ages and different necessities. And that he's like a more, <laughs> more involved with the school staff and the grades and the teachers. And 
I have more patience. Yeah, I think. You have you have clearly defined your roles. And and what I find remarkable is that you had you seem to have had so much family support in this process, even when there were relatives that maybe didn't understand the the depths or the extent to which you were going to make this happen. You had family support and it, it occurs to me that a lot of times in the in the Latino culture that, for example, adoption can be very controversial. Did you encounter that? With yeah, with you know, yeah. When I because you know the book the book is coming out right now in English, but I wrote it in Spanish like a couple of years ago, and I remember when I talked to my boss here, you know, because I'm gonna write a book. It's gonna be about my private life, and the, I I wrote for as you said like a very conservative community. Most of them they are Catholic. And I don't want to to put in you know any damage to the brand that I I am the face of the brand at the same time promoting the magazine in national television and and they said no Armando this is your book I think it's going to be important I remember my bosses said that and then okay let's do it and when I promoted the book at the beginning in the show the Christina in Univision that was a national TV that I cry in front of everybody. I remember every time that I uh, I talk about the process uh, and during those years, it was very hard for me. And and, and then I promoted in, 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 in different part of the country and I never, I never received any negative uh, mm -hmm message from anybody and, and I realize and every time that I talk to my leaders most of them they're women and and they are mothers that they were very impressed to find a father who want to be dedicated to to their children because some of them you know they're they're abandoned by their fathers and they lost their husband and you know and then when they see two men trying to be the best of them to brought their children, they were impressed. And, and it was a very positive, uh, you know, talking to all of this woman. And I love them because, you know, it, sometime I went to re live uh, radio shows and they opened the microphone and they asked me like a weird question, you know, how is the house that, you know, they, if you go to my apartment, uh, you know, it's like a typical house with a lot of plastic toys and, you know, a board and painting and everything is around the children and the, their education. And, um, and for us, the most important thing is that we want them to be good people and, and we, want, we want them to have a, the best education that we can. Right. Absolutely. And I, I love them to travel around the world and I, I, I want them to be in a, in, in a school that is diverse socially, racially, and culturally. And we're lucky to, to live in New York and they have that opportunity here and, and they are completely bilingual. And, you know, at the same time, my children have grown knowing what they were conceived. And when they were little, I created a picture book for them to illustrate how they came into the world. And for a while, Emma would ask me to read it uh, uh, to her every day. And she told me once that it was her favorite book. And, and sometimes it's hard because they're going to school and children sometimes, you know, it's more about the ignorance. Right? And I remember, <clears throat> I think she was like a five years old. She was in kindergarten and they have a piano classes after school. And one of the boys, uh, so you know, to that with her, and then uh, he asked him, when they went to the class, you have to that? He says, yeah, I have to that. I said, then you're adopted. Yeah. He said, I am not adopted. Yes, you are. You have to that. And then she came to us and said, Emma, you know, you are not adopted. You know the process. It's nothing bad to be adopted, but you, you know, I am your biological father. And, and then the next day when we, we went to pick her up, the teacher came to us and said, 
and Emma is shy, you know, she's it, it really shy. And, and she said that Emma during the class, she stand up and she explained how she was created. And, you know, everybody was fascinated because she said that, you know, Papa Ami uh, gave like a, a small worm, she said, and then they put it on a plate and they mix uh, and they create an embryo and they put inside, inside uh, Mary. And then, you know, they put three and one of them, it was me and I was born nine months later. And she's playing with five years old in front of everybody. Wow. And, and, you know, when, when they, when you have, I think even for the, uh, the parents, when they adopt sheep, my advice is always be open. And, you know, if, you, if they grow up with the truth, there is no trauma. You know, this is the reality for them. Then if they grow up thinking something completely different, and then when they are teenagers, they are teenagers, so they are adults, they realize that they came to you from another they have a way of, you know, that's, that's, that's hard and terrible. And, Exactly. I think it's essential, whether children are created through surrogacy or for, through adoption, to know their truth from the beginning. I was struck by the illustration in the book about, I think it was at, was it Emma's birthday when she put together, she made reference to your mother and, and you talk in the book about her, her realization that she didn't have a mother. Yeah, I, I, I remember it, it was the, we were in the car going to Disney and she was like a two or three, that, that was before I made this, this children book, you know, in search of Emma with all the pictures. And we went to Disney and, and we were talking, you know, she was, it was my mother there, it was Gonzalo's mother there. And we were talking about, uh, my mother was talking about her mother and then in the middle of the trip, you know, it was like a 30 minute from Disney. And she said, where's my mother? You know, it was silent. My mother <laughs> almost had a heart attack. And then we explained to her, you know, you have to dad. Some people has a mother and a dad. Some people has to mother, to father. Some people do, some child, they don't have a father or a mother. They, if in a poster home, we explain all the possibilities. And then she said, I want to have a mother. And I said, okay, you want me that your aunt, you know, my sister is going to be your mother. No, no, she's my aunt. I love my aunt. You want Mary, you know, the surrogate mother to be your, because we have a great relationship with Mary. And we visit her every time that we go to San Diego. We send present during Mother's Day. He said, no, no. Mary is my servant mother, you know, she has everything clear. Right. And then I create this book with the pictures and we read it and, and we open the doors for her. And, and what, you know, they have, they have a lot of books right now. I remember when they were uh, small that you can read about different kind of family and, and the important to understand all the kind of family. And what a, what a tribute to your parenting that you have been honest and open and you have created a family environment where your, your children know it's okay to ask those questions. I also commend you for having a relationship with the surrogate. I, but I, I don't want to give the impression that we live in a fantasy, in a, in a you know, in the real world is hard. Uh, when we have Emma, we were living in Miami and we came from San Diego with all the birth certificate that said, I am the father and the mother is on none. You know, by the law, it's, it's said like that, but it's a official birth certificate. I went to the social security office in Miami. And then when I presented all the paper to request for the social security number, the woman said, no, we need the name of the mother. I said, she doesn't have a mother. And then in a microphone with a lot of people outside, she, she was behind the glass. She called her boss. I said, hey, we have a guy here saying that her, his daughter doesn't have a mother. Then they invite me to go inside and 
they call Washington, DC is someone and say, okay, if he has a, a official birth certificate from California, that's a valid document. I said, can you give me some identification of the daughter, my, your daughter? Okay, I can bring a couple of pictures, you know, the pan that they gave me when she was born. This is the only thing that I have on the birth certificate. And then I, I came back the next day and they gave me all the paper. And then I decided, okay, the next time for the twins, I'm gonna do it in San Diego. San Diego was easier. They are more prepared to receive the cut. And they told me this is the first time someone came with a child from surrogacy. No, it was 2005, you know. Oh my goodness. <laughs> you, you made a splash at the Social Security office. Good for you. <laughs> I'm curious, did you, did you have a family meeting about this book before you, before you made the decision oh, to share your story? No, even when I decided that I want to start the process. I, that my mother was in Miami. I called her, and and she said, "Oh my God!" And Ma they call me Mandy. Oh my God, Mandy! But I, I, I think she was thinking that it's gonna be a dream or like an impossible dream. And then a couple of hours later, they called me and said, "I'm gonna support whatever decision you wanna make." And then we called Gonzalo's mother. She was in. In, in Cuba and say, oh my God, life is too difficult. You know, mm -hmm. living in Cuba and thinking about all the expensive and, and having a child. And, and, and then we got all the support of them. And then when we write in the book, they were happy, you know. <laughs> For them, it was like, like having a party, you know. Right. And, and, and at the same time, during those uh, years, I have a cousin having a son, and they have like a, a couple of day difference between Emma and Gustavito. And I have a lot of friends. Everybody was having kids. And I remember every chapter I finished, you know, my friend said she's pregnant. The other one is adopting a baby. And and I was losing my pregnancies and everything. And, and but I saw it like a signal for me, you know. I, I, I didn't feel like, oh, oh they are having uh, their babies and I'm not. No, no, I am having two babies. It's going to take a couple of more months. It's going to cost a lot of <laughs> more, but I'm going to be a father soon. It was in my mind all the time. Yeah. You I know for a lot, of, a lot of infertile couples, it seems like everybody you know is having babies but you. And that can be really painful. So I'm, I'm glad that you saw that as an encouragement. I appreciate that you included that in the book. I'm hoping that our, our viewers will take advantage of the opportunity to post questions in the, in the Q&A because it's a fascinating book and you have a fascinating story. When you were, when you were making the decision to write the story, did you, did you have to contact the surrogate and the egg donor to ask their yeah. permission to... Yeah, I, I think we need to explain that the egg donor, they are anonymous. You know, you never can have uh, access to the sperm donor or to the egg donor. It's always a file with a ton of pictures, all the DNA tests and all the interviews. And in my case, uh, because we, we lost a, a, a donation at the beginning with the egg donor, my the agency that decided that I need to change it and I need to find another egg donor. She wrote me, and you know, I am very, very sensitive with words. She, she sent me a beautiful letter and asked me to wait for her. And then I said, okay, I want to work with you, but I need to meet you. I want to meet you in person. And I had that opportunity. I traveled to San Francisco and I met her and and we had a small video and that would, you know, I mean, you know, immediately I know who is she and I, I respect her space. We never has uh, any contact. Um, but, you know, I follow her in social media and I, <laughs> and I, I, I sometimes she gave me, and she asked me when Emma was born, that she wanted to see a picture of her. And then, of course, I did it. And she said, we have the same eyes. You know? yeah. 
And that was such a beautiful chapter in the book where you describe that that very unique meeting with with the donor and the progression of your initially awkward awkward meeting and how you came to see each other as as very real people. There's also a continued a, a continued reference to is it Mendieta? That you, you shared you shared that common interest in her, and I love the way that you. When I did all the research, that you know, whenever when I identified that donor, but when I did the research, I know she was studying painting and she loved Ana Mendieta. She's a very famous, uh, you know, a Cuban painter that she died a couple of years before I was making Emma. And the Whitney Museum, they have like a, a big show with their pieces. And I bought a book and I decided to, you know, to sign the book and dedicate it to her the day she donated uh, her eggs. I mean, she was very graceful, very, very nice. I'm guessing you never see a Mendieta painting without thinking of her. Oh yeah, all the time. Yeah, and for me, something, even I have a small piece, a, a, photo, a photograph, of her arts and I keep it with me because I think this is like a, I always try try to have emotional connection with everything around me when I'm writing when I have my kids and and Anna Mendieta is the connection that I have with my egg donor and with the sor surrogate is completely different it was open we met you know her family we were during the birthday you know we were there with her the whole day she had kids and we sent present to the kids. She got divorced and then, you know, we talked and, and when we did the show, and we're gonna see the pictures later, when we did the uh, show with Christina in the national, uh, you know, the Univision is the biggest network for Hispanic in the US, we invite her and she was pregnant with the twins and she was uh, with us there. And right now it's different, you know, when they were small, we travel a lot to San Diego, have dinner with her, they play with their kid. For them right now it's weird, you know, and Luca said, oh, it's weird. What is the reason we have to see her? No, because she's not part of the family. They know that, yeah. Again, if you have a question, please feel free to type it into the Q&A box as Armandi will be answering audience questions very soon. Um, Armando, feel, I'm, feel free to ask any questions. We're here too. <laughs> and you're very gracious about answering questions because for many of us, this process is something new. And I love that you have incorporated the, the genealogy element into your family story because it is important to know where, where our stories begin. And your story is so rich with, with different different cities and different characters and, and just everything that it went, went into making that family happen. I know one of the things that you did a lot of is, is research and, and you visited a number of different fertility specialists and had some very, very different experiences with PCPs that weren't always sensitive. And, and I'm, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about that, which is one of the questions we first you. That's, that's important. And I think it's the same with the adoption agencies. And in my case, because sometimes you think, okay, the biggest surrogacy agency in California where all the famous people go there, uh, you think, you know, you want to pay a, a and a fortune is going to be the best way to go. It's not necessarily like that. Yeah, it happened to me. I went there. I, uh, you know, I they interviewed me. I talked to all the owners, and I I I, I felt lost. And then you know I, I'm going to follow because you know it's all these big names and celebrity go there. It has to be safe, uh, but I didn't feel safe. It's not because of. Uh, I think it's, it's, it has to be more with my personality that I explained before that I need emotional connection. I feel that I am in good hands. Then I follow, you know, I, 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 I decided to sell my apartment uh, to, to, you know, because it's, it's a expensive process and we have a dinner at, at our home. 
And then I met a journalist and they said, oh, no, no, I, uh, I know someone who, ha you know, happened the same uh, like you and, and they have twins right now. I called this guy that I don't know and I never met and they recommend a small agency in, in La Mesa. They, they said the most important uh, person here is a doctor. They recommend a clinic, a lawyer, and I follow or this is that. And it was a great process. And you know, I feel like a, it was not a business. You know, when I talk to all these women, and the owner of this agency was a, a, a surrogate mother, because she was a surrogate mother before. And when I talked to Mary and she explained to me that she has a daughter, she wants to go to nurse school, but she doesn't make a, a, enough money to have a babysitter to take care of her daughter. And she wants to study at the same time. And the best way to do it being a surrogate, she loves to be a mother, uh, you know, to be pregnant, and and I said this is my way to go, you know. And then when I interviewed the the egg donor, they said for me this is like a donation. When you need a, a you know a kidney or a heart, and, and in, in my case I'm, do I'm donating a cell for you that you need. And then when you know. When I read everything, I met these people, I said, this is the best way to go. And, you know, you are paying not like a, this is like a, they're selling something, you are spend, you are, you are, you are covering all the expenses to say in a way, you know, it's, they got to go to the clinic, to the test, to the, you are, you are paying expenses more than giving a fortune to someone to have your baby. And if you see this way for your mind, it's much better, I think. Then if you decide to go to have a child for, for adoption, for so, it's surrogacy or whatever, do your research, you know, trying to find the best way for you. And, and it's complete, you know, every person is different. And some agency with all this luxury and all these big building were for some people. For me, it was, I, I felt lost. You know? There seems to be a process of signs and portents that sometimes the, the journey that we're drawn into leads us in places that don't seem to have a purpose. But later in retrospect, you realize that every step in the journey led to the next step. And I, I enjoyed that part of your book where, where you talk about the way that you started with the, the surrogacy agency that was so fancy and, and then hit you with a $90,000 bill. And, and, and I, I'm wondering what you would say to people, because we get this question too all the time, that what, what do people do if they don't have the money for surrogacy for adoption? I didn't have the money. You know, I, for me, you know, I was a senior writer, you know, living in New York is, is really expensive. I have a, an apartment, that's, I have an equity there. But uh, this is, I mean, it's, 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 this is an expense that you have to have, you know. And, and for me, sometimes you have some debts and you pay the debts and you work on it, it's the same. I think so, you know. Uh, there is multiple ways, you know. I, I am no, I, I, I didn't feel comfortable doing outside United States. Yeah. Because, you know, I am American citizen, but I am Cuban, you know, and then I, I thought it's gonna be hard to have your child in any, any other country and then became American citizen and come to here. And I have, I have my child, I have to be with him since the beginning, I, I, I you know, I, I, at the same time, I have to work. I can spend six months a year in India or in Spain waiting for the permit to travel. Uh, and it happened all the time because I, 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 I always reading all these articles about different kind of family trying to have the kids 
that they have their kids in the U.S. and they spend a year outside the U.S. wait for the kids and um, or they're getting divorced and then the kids is a problem, you know. And since the beginning, I thought this is my ch child and it's non negotiable, you know. It's the investment of a lifetime and it's an investment in a lifetime. My partner and and I hope it's gonna be forever, you know, we're together for 30 years. We we met during college, but I, I always think that this is my child. This is a family and we need to fight for the family together. No? And every child should be so fortunate to have such a loving family, I agree. I know we have a number of questions. People are so excited to be able to ask you, ask you things. And one of the questions that's come in um, was from somebody that was wondering, and it, it's a very interesting question. They're asking about how you, how you um, identify the parents in terms of genealogy how, how does what does the family tree look like when you when you become family through surrogacy and how do you list the, the yeah. what yeah. do you for the mother yeah uh when you remember connection means with the egg donor not with the survey mother you know right. when you go to this agency when you can choose all these women uh, and they have certain age, everybody's around the twenties. Uh, all of them, they are in college. All of them, they want to go to do a, a master or a doctorate. And and I and I explained before, I always try to find emotional connection with them. It's not culturally some something that you're gonna feel connected to them. And and they have to present the old, you know, DNA tests uh, from her and the 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 old tree for the family. You know, the sister, brothers, mother, grandparents from both sides. You have you have everything. Uh, right now, for example, I did the the DNA test to all of them, and and it's open. And, then, and we can see from the egg donor some connection with, you know, cousin and everything. But, you know, the, I, I know all the, the DNA tests from the egg donor and I have it for them. But of course, I don't have the grandparent from, from the mother's side. That's, that's logical. And remember, I am a journalist. I know all of them. But, for, but that, that's something that, uh, I am never gonna discuss with them uh, until they can go. You know, I know uh, because I think they don't need it. So I, and if they need it, they're trying to find by themselves. You know, I have to follow the law all the time. You know? I want to thank Therese for that for that question about pedigree, which I think is very important. There's another comment from Gretchen who says that she just wants to thank you for sharing your story because her family was built by several similar means and upon a founded foundation of much love. And she thanks you for your openness and for your words. Uh, there's another question from, from Margaret who is, Curious about your process for writing this book. Did you keep a diary and how did you pull it all together? Yeah, uh, I, I always writing, you know, I, I always said that I am a reader who writes. <laughs> read all the time and write. I, I didn't know that I took a lot of notes from the process until I got the offer from HarperCollins to write a book. When I went back, you know, to all these files, some of them in paper, some of them you know, online, I have a lot of notes. I have even dialogues and I was shocked. I, I never thought that I have all this kind of detail. When I saw all the detail that I have, when I see, I saw all the record from the money I spent. Uh, when I saw all the interviews that I have from different uh, fertility doctors, I said, okay, I think I can write a book. And then, you know, you need to, decide what is going to be your voice. Uh, at the moment, I was writing a novel that I never thought I was going to be 
it's going to be published, you know. And I decide that this book, it has to be sound like a long letter to my daughter. Uh, it was like an open dialogue. Sometimes at the beginning, I was like, a, I was talking to her and then we decided with the editor that it's, it has to be more, more a letter than a dialogue. And I am, you know, I'm waiting for Emma to read it. I remember when she was 12 years old, she read my, my first novel, The German Girl. And I was more stressed that when the, the New York Times critic were reading the book. And, and I remember her reaction with the book right now, because, you know, I, I was waiting to have it in English for her to read it. And, and we got the copy today. And then hopefully she's going to read it uh, next weekend. Yeah. Okay, she will definitely appreciate it. I know there's a question from somebody that didn't have a chance to read the book yet, who is asking if you had other children after Emma and whether they were through surrogacy as well. Yeah, I have when I when I, when we have Emma, I, I said, okay, uh, this was really expensive. Uh, they trained me. I I, I it, it's it's like a surviving a storm the whole process and dealing with lawyers and papers. And, you know, it was really far from us. It, 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 we living in this coast and it was, and when Emma was two years old, she said, I want to have a brother or, or a sister. And I know it's a two years old and that's happening in all the families and we have a embryos, frozen embryos. And, and I said to Gonzalo, why not? And then we were more prepared. And we have our saving already. And, and we were less involved with the process because I don't have to travel every week for the whole process. And we didn't have any accident. We were lucky. Then we were looking for a sister or a brother for Emma. And when the survey called us that it was baby A and baby B, we were in shock. <laughs> And, and I was with her there with the ultrasound and the doctor say, I can see a heartbeat here. I can see another heartbeat. Uh, with Emma, we have all the videos and pictures and everything. With the twin, I stopped filming. I, I can. And then it was great because we have a boy and a girl and they are, uh, they are great. Uh, all of them, they're great, but you know, I, I love my twins and they are very close together. And, and, and I remember when they were born, I had to update in search of Emma. I was writing the book and, and my youngest daughter, Anna, uh, one, uh, always asked me when I want to write in search of Emma, yeah, Anna and Lucas. And, and then with the English edition, I create all this, you know, chapter talking about them and they are very close. And right now they're 11, they're gonna be 12, so they're gonna be teenagers and, and they are very focus oriented in what they wanna be. Uh, you, know, one, uh, you know, Emma wants to go to medical school. She loved Boston, by the way. We took all the school there and, and oh, hopefully she's gonna be studying in beautiful Boston. And that's, that's her dream. And Lucas want to be a builder and engineering. And Anna, since she was like a two years old, she wanted to be a veterinary. And we went to Cornell to see the school there. And they're good students. And that's that's our role, you know. Had oh, them, you the, it, I, is your family complete now? I think so. I I feel like a, being a human exile here, no, when you have to leave your country, your family, your books, your house, you know, and you have to start from zero, you have to learn a language, you need, you need to make a living here, and then uh, I have been with people in Espanol, and I have a job that I love, and and then I, I published In Search of Emma, I have my two novels, the third one's gonna be soon, and when I see all my books, because I always want to be a writer, I, I, I can assure you that me, 
the biggest thing that I make my my bigger success for me is children. You know, uh, even I, you know, I, I am very grateful and we have a publishing house like San Francisco and Harper Collins publishing my books, but having my children is, is a dream come true, you know. And well, you're the, obviously a wonderful father and Gonzalo also. There's one more question that's been asked and that's from somebody who is wanting to know if you've ever thought about writing a children's book because they definitely think you should. A children books? Yeah. Yeah, well, that's that's Anna and Lucas asking all the time. And Emma said, you have to write a science fiction book. Uh, and uh, I, I love to have, you know, even in search of Emma, because I have this book for children, it could, it, you know, it could become a, a children book. But it's not about me, it's about the agent and the publishing house, you know. Maybe in, the, in search of Emma is, is, is doing great. Maybe we're, we're going to have the opportunity to have the, a version for, you know, a young adult or, or children, you know. I'd love to do that, yeah. Wonderful. And, you know, the, the more happy is going to be my children. They ask me all the time about it. And let me tell you, Anna in particular, she's always helping me with the name of the character of my books, <laughs> the title of the book. And she's always, she's the only one who wants to know exactly what I'm writing on what I wrote during the day when we talk at times. You know. Are the twins going to be lobbying for a book of their own? Uh, no, hopefully. <laughs> I, 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 they don't want to read it. They don't want to read it now. I think they are too young. Emma is ready to read. In search of Emma, it's a hard book, I think, for a child. Uh, because uh, I, I, I am a cry, and I cried a lot, and I, I remember crying, writing this book. Even every time that I do a presentation, and I explain to Margaret here in the Boston uh, book library, library that uh, I can read fragments, uh, you know, observe from the books. I can. It's too emotional for me. Well, you have shared so much of yourself in this book and, and in this webinar, and we're so grateful. I know that you have graciously agreed to share a special album of photos as yeah. well. Yeah, because we're talking about, you know, Emma, Anna, Lucas, and the family, but I, I think it's time to meet them. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Thanks. Okay, this is Mary the Sorry. When we went, they were, she was pregnant with the twins, and we went to the show of Christina in Univision. And he's my partner, yeah. The next one. This is Emma, she was two, year, uh, two days old and we were in San Diego, California. Emma, she was three years old when we moved to, to New York from Miami. This is our first Christmas picture. You know, the twins were born December 13. They were babies, we, they were the, Luca has to stay for a couple of weeks at the hospital, and that's the time when Emma met, uh, you know, her brother and sister. Next one, our first picture in Central Park, in New York. I love this picture. This was in in Port Gables, in our house in Miami, and Emma was like a six month, I think. Emma, yeah, she's uh, in, it was an elementary school around uh, the school around our apartment in New York. We went to Paris, of course, and jumping in front of the Eiffel Tower. Our first trip to Hawaii with the whole family. We love them. Yeah. Winter in our upstate house in, in New York. In Cancun, and she was talking to my sister, uh, ask, uh, uh, you know, begging to have a cat. And we have a cat, Mina, right now. We went to China because Emma was studying Mandarin and she was really good in Mandarin. And we decided to spend one spring break in China. This in, in, the, in the famous, you know, wall in China. 
signing uh, in, 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 in search of a mine in Spanish when during the uh, Miami International Book Fair. Yeah. We went to Turkey. Next one. Hi, uh, this is the whole family, one of the Christmas picture. We're trying to have a, a whole family picture every year around December, November, the, it's their birthday. And the only year that we missed, it was the last year because of COVID. And hopefully we're gonna have it this year too. And Emma with the book, hopefully she's just gonna read it soon. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret Elizabeth. Thank you for having me. Armando, what a wonderful family you have. Um, we would so welcome Emma here in Boston and Anna and Lucas too. So we hope you'll share them with us. Um, Elizabeth, thank you so much for your, your expert moderation. You know so much about this topic. And Armando, thanks for sharing your story and your family life with us. Um, we at American Ancestors New England Historic Genealogical Society are delighted to have co-presented tonight's talk. If you're researching your family, traditional or untraditional, you might find our library and education center can be useful. Our stacks on Newbury Street have reopened and NEHGS members can use their digital archives um, anytime, uh, anytime that they want, or you can chat with one of our genealogists. Our Brew Family Learning Center is hosting many educational programs this month. Um, we're looking at how to research Jewish immigration to America, historical and recent adoptions and civil war history. You can see for yourself at AmericanAncestors.org. Our mission is to educate inspire and connect people on family topics. For you literary sorts, you book lovers, join us for more free author talks. A week from today, again with the Boston Public Library, we'll look at Chinese immigration. Columbia professor and award-winning author Mei Nye will discuss her new book, The Chinese Question, The Gold Rushes and Global Politics. She'll be joined by Jilin Yang, national editor for the New York Times and author of One Mighty an Irresistible Tide, The Epic Struggle Over American Immigration, 1924 to 1965. We'll be joined by partners from GBH Forum Network, the State Library, and the Boston Book Festival. So come back with me and Kristen for that. And on Tuesday, November 4, in a midday program, we're welcoming Anne Willen, the remarkable chef and founder of La Varenne Cooking School in Paris. She'll be in conversation with the award-winning food writer Cheryl Julian, formerly of the Boston Globe. The pair will discuss Anne's new book, Women in the Kitchen, 12 Essential Cookbook Writers Who Defined the Way We Eat from 1661 to Today. So don't miss this foray into the history of food. And on this November 9th, we'll be focused with the Boston Public Library on the Transcendentalists and their world. Historian Robert A. Gross will share his latest work on luminaries Emerson, Thoreau, Hawthorne, and all of that coterie. He'll be in discussion with Cindy Brockway of the Trustees. Her organization brilliantly manages many related transcendentalist properties in Concord, Massachusetts, the epicenter of that movement. You can join us virtually for this or in person at the Boston Public Library. So many great opportunities, lots going on. Kristen, back to you. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you so much, Armando and Elizabeth. That was a fascinating discussion and thank you for sharing your story. A reminder for those of you watching, if you'd like to get your own copy, your own signed copy of In Search of Emma, you can order it from our partners for today's talk, Trident Booksellers and Cafe. The information is in the chat. You can use the code BPL ship for free media mail shipping. You can also check your local public library and borrow a copy there. For resources, programs, and services from the Boston Public Library for people of all ages, please check us out at bpl.org or please visit us at one of our locations around the city. Um, we do have a few also, uh, also a few other literary type programs coming up, all virtual. And the first one this Friday is with Daphne A. Brooks. She is the winner of the Museum of African American History Stone Book Award this year and her book 
liner notes for the revolution. She'll be in, in conversation with BPL President David Leonard. That'll be at 3 p.m. on Friday over Zoom webinar, just like we are here. On Wednesday, October 27th at 6 p.m. in the evening, we will be having a conversation with Reese Jones and his new book, White Borders. And Garrett Dash Nelson from the Leventhal Map Center here at the library will serve as the moderator for that conversation. And finally, in person and virtually, so wherever you are, you can join us or you can come here to the Central Library. We'll be having an evening on November 3rd at 6 p.m. with Larry Spotted Crowman and his book, Drumming and Dreaming. And David Leonard, BPL president, will once again be in conversation for that program. So thank you for joining us tonight. We hope to see you soon, virtually or in person. Take care, be well, good night.